Hello and welcome to Naive and Dangerous, a podcast about emergent media brought to you by two media researchers. My name is Ted, and you can find me on Twitter at Ted Mitio. Hello, and my name is Chris, and you can find me on Twitter at CL underscore more. Hello, Chris. Hello, Ted. Our topic for today is the medieval. And this is this is probably one of those topics that we've we've had ready to go we've been thinking about for oh, what two years now and, and and actually sitting down and working through our ideas about this and um it's definitely it was something in our mind when we said okay let's do a podcast it was it was in the dock early on and um i think i think it's great that we're going to finish out uh 2019 uh, and the pod and the season yeah. one of the podcast. S- um, uh, finish it on a high with uh, a topic that is so dear to our hearts uh, that uh, we we wanted to cover for so long already. Um, our titles. Let's, we have, there. Yeah, let's go there. So uh, as usual, we have uh, we have a few titles. Actually, we have two this time for for the podcast. Um, and my title title is. Uh, uh, a Latin one, uh, and it is Gaudiamus Igitur. Um, you can see it uh, 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 later when we when we upload the podcast, uh, and it means "Let us rejoice." Uh, this is a really interesting uh, um, title. This is actually the opening of a song, uh, and this is the this was the the song for uh, students in all medieval universities in Europe. Right. Yes, and it was. Uh, it is. I highly recommend you guys uh, to Google it and uh, find the full text of the song. Uh, it's it's hilarious. It's uh, very bohemic, uh, very uh, happy. Uh, it's uh, it's very much the essence of the spirit of of uh, the medieval. Um, it's. Uh, Mildly blasphemous. <laughs> uh, Perfect. <laughs> it is. It's very much uh, uh, concerned with uh, life and death, uh, but also with the celebration of of being young and uh, young in spirit, and uh, and um, uh, enjoying life. So, uh, Gaudialus Igitur. This was the song of uh, the Goliards. So, the Goliards was a movement uh, in medieval Europe of uh, predominantly students who uh, are part vagabond, part uh, homeless, part uh, traveling anarchic syndicate, part pirates, part poets, (laughs) uh, part many other things. So they would travel from, uh, let's say, in the winter, in the European winter, they would be down south in southern Italy in the University in Salerno, uh, where this was the most famous medical university. So they would go and take classes in medicine there because it was warm in the winter. And then in the summer, they would travel all the way up to Paris to the famous theological uh, faculty where, you know, they'll get uh, classes in philosophy. Um, and their entire year will pass in traveling between these two distant points. Very sensible. <laughs> they will travel through, through Prague, Prague, the University of in Prague later became uh, uh, part of that map. Then they will go to Heidelberg in Germany. So a lot of places in Europe still have this. Uh, if you go to the old universities, you would still encounter that spirit in uh, uh, in the old halls. Where where were these students coming from? Where, what kind of um, what kind of families? What kind of lives led to, to becoming a student? Uh, anyone could. Right. So there was no class uh, separation. The elite, uh, the aristocracy, uh, would not go to universities. They would have private uh, tutors. Uh, tutors, and they would be directly going into. Um, advanced positions of power. Right. So universities were where uh, peasants or peasant children awesome. uh, who, who one way or another found their way in the cities because universities were in the cities exclusively. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the urban proletariat basically would uh, plus the urban middle class, the craftsmen, the children of the uh, craftsmen of uh, um, the guilds. Uh, so they would be the ones going to the 
universities. I remember also something which is now sounds absurd to to uh, um, a modern understanding of the state and of institutions in the state that uh, the famous universities uh, of Europe, such as Bologna, for example, Padua, they were started with a royal charter from the Holy Roman Emperor, which gave them absolute and total autonomy, which means that they, these spaces were exterritorial. Yeah. So city police, for example, had no access to the university uh, grounds without express permission. They, for tax purposes, were exterritorial as well. So you can imagine these were basically states, uh, kind of mini states within city states. Did they have their own kind of police on campus? Did they have their own kind of men at arms or, you know? Good question. I don't know. Yeah. As far as I know, uh, Just they didn't. Just senior lecturers with big sticks. <laughs> as, as far as I know, for example, the Paris University used to be in what is now called in Paris the Latin Quarter or the Left Bank of the River Seine. And uh, so this is the part of, the only part of Paris which is actually authentic because people are in love with Paris, but what you're seeing is a 19th century Rebuilding. monstrosity. Yeah. It's a horror yeah. compared to the awesome city that Paris was before Baron Haussmann destroyed it uh, in order to prevent any future uh, Paris communes because yeah. it, it, the Paris was rebuilt in the uh, second part of the 19th century after the 1848 commune where people were building barricades on those medieval streets, narrow streets, perfect for urban uh, battle. So uh, they destroyed the streets. Champs-Élysées appeared as this gigantic boulevard where everyone is so enamored with. Actually, it's a monstrosity. It, it paved over uh, a huge and, and wonderful neighborhood. So anyways, you have the, <laughs> you have the left bank. Let me just finish yeah, this. Yeah. And the left bank, the, um, the Latin Quarter, as, as it was known, was where the university was and uh, where all the students were staying. And so it was infamous for... It's uh, utter bohemian chaos uh, because you had uh, tens of thousands of students who would be lodging there and constantly getting into fights and uh, trying to earn a buck in any way possible. That was one of my questions. How did how did the students, you know, fund their travel between these universities? You, you know, where, what kind of revenue could they raise? They would uh, they would hire themselves as uh, often as scraps because they yeah. would they would know how to read and write. Um, they would uh, be doing all sorts of physical labor plus any anything that uh, uh, could give you money. So it's talking late medieval here? Or oh, mid, mid, the, so. the Goliaths, this phenomenon that I'm describing, yeah, started already in the uh, early 13th century yeah, with the, right. the arrival of the first universities. The first universities in Europe started in the late 12th century. This is late 1100s, yeah. right, in Italy, and then spread like wildfire across. Uh, but we'll go there. We are kind of jumping I, ship. So I, I want to. I like this. I like this, and and I, and I think this should be our title for two reasons. Um, first is the, the 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 fact that you mentioned that this is a song. Uh, this is audio. We're, we're gonna. We're, mm. I'm gonna stick a pin in that because we're gonna come. Okay, we're well, gonna come back to, to that. But also, I just like this idea idea of rejoicing. You know, we're at the, we're heading at the end of the year. Um, I think. I think you and I are feeling a little bit of weight lifting from getting through the semester, looking forward to spending time with our families at the end of the year. It's nice to finish with on such a high note mm. with, with this idea of rejoicing and, and celebrating. I think that's really wonderful. Um, there, is, uh, uh, there, is, there is great joy in the medieval period. This is one of the things that... Uh, uh, was one of the truths, if you will, or one of the uh, aspects of the medieval period that uh, was very quickly lost with the arrival of the Renaissance because um, it ended up being painted as, a, as this dark time. Absolutely. Everyone has heard of the Dark Ages. Yeah. And nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the Renaissance was a very dark time compared to medieval uh, Europe. It was a dark time in basically in any respect you could think of. Uh, with the exception of uh, uh, super rich magnate sponsored art, because that's what the Renaissance is, right? It's basically the Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos of that time sponsoring uh, artists, uh, their favorite artists. But uh, we're jumping. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're jumping. <laughs> we're jumping. Um, I think I think that's going to be the case today. We're going to be jumping around the medieval uh, period and, and medieval and medieval as a concept. Um, the second, uh, it's a quote, um, the second quote that, that 
uh, I want to share for this episode is um, uh, an, an idea, a, a comment from McLuhan, McLuhan and McLuhan, in fact, um, from the, the, the book Laws of Media, uh, The New Science. And McLuhan says, uh, Marshall McLuhan, that is, says, Medieval and ancient sensibility now dominates our time as acoustic and multi-sensory awareness displaces the merely visual. So again, you can already see the connection there between the song and the audio. And, um, you know, I've, I've been reading a lot of McLuhan lately and 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 was, was surprised. I, had, I didn't kind of make the connection previously just how much of a medievalist McLuhan was. And he, and we'll get back to this later on, but he kind of makes the argument that from the electronic era, the era of television onwards, we are beginning to return to a fundamental medievalism. Uh, and we'll, un- we'll unpack that later because I think it's important first to lay the groundwork of what the medieval period is. Absolutely. And, but and how we think about it. Uh, I am afraid I might forget, so I'll just uh, uh, plug this in right now. The podcast as a format is a very medieval format, um, uh, very much unlike uh, uh, the newspaper or the book, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because uh, the medieval tradition uh, of uh, the spread of culture was an oral tradition predominantly, and uh, it was spread through song and through poem. That is how the multitude would encounter culture and would would uh, enact culture and would spread it. I think um, I think we're going to unpack this a little bit as we go because um, this is a really core uh, feature that, that resonates with both of us. Um, I think the recent rise of, of podcasting, but also the the massive success uh, of Audible, which of course is an Amazon company, mm-hmm. uh, and the the rise of audiobooks. Uh, there's been um, really huge uh, improvements lately in. Um, voice to speech synth- synthesization synthesis oh gosh here we go uh, voice to speech apps and um, a, a range of, 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 of apps available now that offer very human like text to speech um, so far that they've mapped accents mm-hmm. you can now get a, a, you know a, a clearly Australian voice to speech. Um, accent. I was I was actually listening to a text to speech version of McLuhan the other day, and I'm like, no, this Australian accent isn't working for me. I'm going to have to switch <laughs> to a North Canadian. American. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need Canadian there. <laughs> so, um, so the return of the of the audio is, and the audio, as McLuhan um, just, just finds it, is 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 part of this um, re-embracing of a culture, not entirely lost because music and radio. Have, have been with us, but um, distance from learning. And I think we're starting to recapture that. I want to get back into that later yeah. because I, 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 think, I think we need to just kind of map out, just really in brief, what the medieval period is. What the parameters of the medieval period. Uh, yeah, and what we're talking about. And uh, see, this is a really interesting thing. I mean, we could have uh, an entire cycle of lectures of what is the medieval and what oh, the parameters sure. are. In fact, uh, there are great um, courses uh, on Audible on the medieval period that I have dipped into. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a number of uh, amazing uh, online lectures as well uh, from, from famous historians. Uh, the thing with the medieval, though, is, uh, and, and you, you are going to, if you start digging into that, into a definition of what the medieval period uh, was, even uh, in, in terms of dating, um, is uh, this is a very... Uh, how to say, a very uh, uh, intense battleground. Yes, um, contested. Uh, why? Because um, the until, until quite recently, the definition of those dates was somewhere from, let's say, uh, the mid-5th century where you had the uh, collapse of the uh, official final collapse of the Roman Empire where the final Roman emperor got deposed by uh, uh, the gods. And, uh, uh, and it was a purely formal act of, uh, you know, removing an unnecessary figurehead because, uh, in fact, the Roman Empire had, in the West had collapsed some time ago, but uh, some time before. Uh, so we have from the mid-5th 
to the uh, the uh, fall of uh, Constantinople to the uh, Turks. So that's uh, 1453, so the, until the mid 15th century. Uh, so it's this 1,000 year. It's a nice, and when you look at this and you realize that this is something only only an academic historian could come up with this kind of dating because <laughs> you realize it fits very nicely on PowerPoint slides and uh, <laughs> yeah, you but can. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That, no, none of this uh, makes sense. For, in many respects, the medieval, if, if you use one sort of uh, taxonomy, had started much earlier. Uh, and if you use another, it has started much later. Ended much later. Uh, uh, and, and ended much later or ended much earlier. In fact, yeah. I would prefer to argue that uh, yeah, um, the medieval uh, ended with the arrival of the Black Death. The Black Death in the mid-14th century was uh, the, the uh, catastrophic yeah. uh, and, and uh, uh, shocking event which uh, changed everything. It's, like it, it's a meme almost uh, when you say it, but it changed uh, uh, the economics of the continent, in, uh, changed uh, uh, how people thought about the death, changed uh, culture uh, very much so, uh, freed tremendous amount of uh, uh, capital, um, t- tremendously increased the cost of uh, labor uh, so people could uh, uh, demand more. So, because anyways, but we we'll, yeah. I, I think, um, particularly from an Australian perspective, that and okay, um, you know, before someone says, "Okay, boomer," I'm you know Gen X. So, growing up with with learning history in a particular way, history was taught when when you know I was in primary school and high school in dates, and and all history was was really l- uh, memorizing key dates, mm. and it was such a disservice. There's a whole generation of Australians who are disconnected from from global history because we were forced to memorise dates and it was abstract and disconnected. Exactly. And it wasn't until much later on in life that I, I was exposed to this. And even recently, you know, to talking to you, like what the medieval was and meant. And um, it's it's not only in Australia, you know. This is, a, I think, it's a global uh, yeah. uh, um, deficiency. It's... Uh, uh, one of the great uh, evils that uh, modern uh, academic professional historians are perpetrating on humanity is teaching history in this way. Uh, because what happens auto- automatically is that uh, uh, students and people who encounter history in this way um, don't gain any understanding uh, of, of a systemic nature. They don't understand processes. They don't understand why certain things are happening in a certain way. What were the what was the context? What were the important influences? Don't understand time. Exactly. Don't understand duration. This is the thing. And history is duration. So they don't understand that. And on the other hand, they also don't understand the role of the individual. Yeah. Right? So, and it's really interesting. There's this pathetic, and I use this word on purpose because I'm a trained historian. Uh, um, my, my first degree was in that. And it is a pathetic, uh, this tremendous amount of uh, uh, um, emotions thrown in it. Uh, argument uh, between historians, so this is an argument within history, what is uh, um, more important? Is it the role of the individual or is it the role of uh, uh, historical processes? So do are individuals more important or determining uh, or are historical processes uh, determining? And you know, this is the kind of academic uh, argument that you know people uh, lose all hope for in academy for. Uh, but uh, what's interesting here, why am I mentioning all this? Because if you try and argue uh, and answer it for yourself uh, and to have a working understanding of what the medieval period is, you need to understand that this is a period in which an old empire collapsed. So this is uh, the Roman Empire, and it, uh, the Roman Empire was a, uh, an uh, institution of tremendous cultural uh, importance for the entire Mediterranean and Western Europe and, uh, and the Balkans and the Middle East. And... Uh, so it, it collapsed, left a fragment uh, of itself in uh, which was and ended up being known as Byzantium, right? Uh, yeah. Or as the Byzantines called themselves the Eastern Roman Empire. And then you had the arrival and mass of uh, no one has pro- produced a, a meaningful figure, but we're looking at millions uh, of um, immigrants coming from uh, uh they, originally, they, w- they were coming from uh, what is now called Eastern Europe. Um, so these are the, Gothic, the different Germanic and Gothic tribes and Frankish tribes, etc., uh, etc., et the Lombards, um, who came, 
who started from what is the territory of nowadays Belarus and Ukraine and found themselves uh, settling uh, Italy, settling France, settling Germany, settling Spain, settling North Africa, um, in, in a huge chain of, of kind of wave after wave of migrations, where entire tribes will move um, and, and resettle. And uh, what's interesting is that in many places they were settling in empty lands. Uh, this is another thing which is uh, fascinating. So uh, part of the argument about the Roman, uh, uh, the, the collapse of the Roman Empire, the start of the medieval period is this, that uh, the, if, you, if you look, and this is, n- no one is teaching you this. You have to be figuring things on your own, uh, figuring things out when you, are, when, when you are reading between the lines, um, different books on the period. But um, what's interesting is that you had an empire which collapsed under its own weight, of uh, corruption, of uh, over-bureaucratization, of uh, um, over-taxation. So peasants and mass would li- literally pick up their bags and, uh, and leave the land um, and, this, and, and join the tribes which would come and settle the land or act, they would often act as guides and things like that. So you had massive exchange of, of uh, uh, population. And, and this is uh, this is the beginning of uh, the medieval period where you had uh, this um, uh, the Franks settling in in France. Uh, you had and pushing out the uh, native population or and mixing up with the native population. The only population that remained untouched, more or less, was the Bretons, and that's why you have Brittany in. Uh, right. Um, yep. uh, that's why uh, interesting. It, uh, connecting this to the Anglo-Saxon tradition now, when the Saxons, these Saxons were part also of this movement, and the Angles as well. So the Angles and the Saxons uh, went on their ships and, and traveled to England to settle post-Roman England, which the Romans abandoned. They pushed out the native uh, population as well. And so uh, the story of King Arthur is the story of the fight of these uh, Romano Britons to survive and to have relevance. The, and it's not accidental that they got pushed down to Cornwall, and many of them actually ended up uh, getting on a ship and going to Brittany in France. <laughs> uh, that's why uh, it's the Ar- Brittany, yeah. exactly. That's why the Arthurian legend actually starts in in uh, in, uh, in Brittany, yeah. and then moves to. <laughs> to England. Anyways, is that, is that where Excalibur is in Brittany? Uh, no, traditionally no. Excalibur is supposed to be in England, uh, or supposed to supposed to have been in England, but. Uh, the stories started there. Yeah. Um, speculate, speculation is because they, the, the people who were running away from the Saxons and arriving in Brittany carried this, this oral tradition with them. Just to make some, some connections there that were popping up in, in my mind as, as you were unpacking that for us is, the, um, of course, the, the massive entropy that was tugging at the former Roman Empire and seeing this, this, the, the final dissolution of that and the amazing amount of energy in people who are, you know, displacing themselves and traveling. And these are all themes that we've talked about yeah, yeah. and this movement and, and those, that, that migration bringing an enormous amount of power and, and, and then re-energizing and re- reforming at this enormous um, part of the globe. See, one of the uh, things again, if you if you tell this to people now, few people would believe it. But yeah. uh, um, that period, so from uh, let's say around the beginning of the fifth century or the end of the fourth, where you had the total uh, um, degeneration and collapse of, of uh, the, the Roman Empire as a state and as a, as a social institution and as a culture, uh, literally disintegration. Uh, it it didn't just is when you read history books and you have uh, historians are very poor at explaining this kind of thing that it didn't just happen yeah. and it's these, these are processes which last a very long time there's a duration there centuries yeah so uh, if you look at uh, uh, so what, what was happening is that um, you had uh, everyone has heard of the vandals right the idea of you know you have vandalism right so the vandals were actually uh, known as the Vents, they came from. Uh, you we, you hear of them in the uh, Ballad of Beowulf, right? So these are the Vendish yes, tribe, yes. exactly. This is the same right. tribe, which came all the way from the Baltic. So part of that tribe basically picked up their backs when they heard that you know this stuff's happening down there, 
And they traveled all the way from there. They sacked Rome, which had been sacked many times before already. So, uh, and from there, they on foot traveled, uh, if, if you have the map of Europe in your head, on foot from Italy through southern France, through Spain, through Gibraltar, into northern Africa. And they basically settled all of what is now northern Africa all the way up into to Egypt. And uh, it was a very rich and powerful Vandal kingdom, which basically uh, was uh, uh, defeated by the Byzantines in their last effort to to uh, expand and re- uh, recapture the empire during Justinian. This is the beginning of the 7th century. And then finally you have the the, the other great migration of peoples, which usually European uh, historians uh, fail to mention, which is the Arab migration, right? Yeah. Because the, the Arab migration happened in the beginning of the 7th century, expanded and reached all the way into northern Spain and southern France. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you have these gigantic movements of people. And this is a process which lasts several centuries and kind of settles only around the time of uh, Charles the Great, uh, Charlemagne, as the French call him and uh, the Franks used to call him. Uh, and so he, w- he was the unifier of the Frankish, Franco-Germanic space. And uh, uh, he's around this time, this, this is the beginning of the ninth century, right? So around this time, uh, the, the dust settles and you've had, you've had some sort of uh, uh, ossification of the borders and the migrations of the people stop. Before we move on from that point, I wonder, um, given contemporary anxieties, um, particularly in the media, about massive numbers of migration mm. and the, the movements of people and attempts to restrict the movements of people, we see this happening, mm. in, of course, in our own country, across Europe, uh, America. Uh, and even even across Asia, is, is is there some kind of acknowledgement of learning the historical lessons that, that, uh, that, no, that these established powers don't want to lose their power by allowing freedom of movement? See the the where to begin? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this, is, this is such an epic question. I mean, the first thing that you have to remember and remind people constantly, because every time I tell this to students, people think I'm crazy. Um, you know, the passport, uh, you know, it appeared only in the 20th century, right? Um, and the first place in the world to institute passports was Prussia, which was the most police state right. to exist, the biggest and the only utter police state to exist in uh, in Europe in the 19th century. And it was the laughing stock of Europe because of that. Everyone was making fun of, look at these crazy Prussians. Look at these <laughs> idiots, right? Look at what they're doing, right? Passports, visas. They were the inventors of all of this. It didn't exist. In the 19th century Europe, so this is not, not even 200 years ago, uh, everyone listening, uh, you could travel anywhere. And no one, I mean, if you read about the romantics, we'll talk about the romantics later, hopefully. Mm-hmm. It, there was no such thing as passport. You just get on a ship and go, right? And the only thing that matters is do you have money? Do you have money to pay for lodging? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you speak the universal <laughs> language? <laughs> yes, okay, welcome. <laughs> no, like, there, there was no such thing, right? Um, the, uh, the only exception here was, uh, and this was the universal exception, when people, because people always um, organize themselves uh, in one way or another is into a us and them. Mm-hmm. So there, is, there will always be an in and out. So uh, traditionally, so pre-passports, pre-modern state, that was based on faith, right? So if you were to travel as a Christian in uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire, you would need to have uh, some sort of paper from the local officials telling in, in the paper saying that, you know, you are under the protection of the local official. You are allowed to travel because you are infidel, yeah. right? You are, so uh, when you read again about uh, the first archaeologists um, who would go into the Ottoman, like Heinrich Schliemann, who dis- the discoverer of Troy, so he needed permits to, to literally to be there. Um, uh, yeah, if you are, uh, and, but this of course means, uh, this is uh, an important, important caveat. If you are standing out, right? If you are trying to look like everyone else, uh, then it, and you wouldn't be uh, immediately identified as a foreigner, then no one will be asking you for any 
papers or things like that. So and, anyways. And these aren't papers like a passport saying no, no, you no. belong to this, you no, belong no, no. to this, but the, rather you just have permission you, to be here and you are protected. So You are protected, yeah. literally. No, yeah. It's not even about permission, you're protected. And would that, yeah. be, that would be a payment yeah, as well. You presumably would, there's a payment involved. Yeah. Uh, merchants would be uh, the, the people who would uh, normally be, you know, involved in this because, you know, they're, they're the the quintessential travelers. Hence the rise of mercenaries to protect the, the merchants. Again, coin is the, is the passport. <laughs> of course. But you see, you framed it very nicely. Uh, the passport is a piece of paper which identifies a nation to which you belong, right? Uh, this notion of you belong to this nation is a very modern uh, phenomenon. It didn't exist. Um, what did exist, and, and I will credit my eighth grade history teacher here, uh, is the is the medieval and I think it, I think it's a bit late or mid to late medieval if I'm, I'm wrong is the rise of the city state. So the, this is a fantastic point. I was just thinking about this because uh, with the city states and the city states appeared uh, in the 11th and in the 12th century. Right. Um, why? Uh, because they. Uh, it's a great example here. This is uh, uh, one of the great uh, arguments for self-organization as a phenomenon, as a social phenomenon, because these were uh, usually self-organized uh, organisms first, which were then very quickly recognized by the kings. And uh, why? Because they would petition the king uh, or the, the Holy Roman Emperor for uh, special charters, which gave them rights separating them and differentiating them from the countryside and from the local lords, right? So how would, why did I say this is self-organized? Because you, how it worked is uh, you would have uh, a, a few merchants uh, choosing the city as a place where, you know, uh, you could uh, um, you could uh, make money and uh, out of human, tra- uh, the, the traffic of travelers, etc., etc. And then, uh, you know, craftsmen will be there or it might be the other way around, craftsmen starting and then merchants coming in. Uh, the point is that This would grow organically and uh, inevitably they would uh, demand the charter and they would demand the charter by petitioning. And so how this worked in practice is that they, so let's say you're the king and I am representative of a a city state or a nascent city which wants to become a city state so an autonomous city because that's what the city state uh, is. So I would come to you and petition to please give me a charter which allows me, which basically makes me an uh, ex-territory. Uh, I'm not, uh, as a city, not subject to any of the local feudal lords. Yep. And in return, I oblige myself to pay you an annual fee of X, right? So, or a percentage of uh, traffic or from, yep. uh, let's say, you are um, you are given as the king 10% from the annual fare, which generates huge amounts of income. So as a king... Uh, or might not yeah. be um, pure coin. It might be, uh, you know, uh, goods. Um, it might be goods. Services. Et cetera, uh, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, this this was a very established practice. And uh, uh, this is, by the way, where the word incorporation comes from. Uh, and we, we hear of corporations today, and they have such a bad, uh, and rightly so, such a bad rap, but it comes from uh, Latin. It means incorpore, which means in in the body. So the idea was that this entity, and this is why the big difference between corporations today and uh, the, in, uh, the corporations of medieval Europe, uh, uh, um, how they how they were, is that uh, you would be uh, represented in the body. So you have skin, in, you're recognized as having skin in the game, and you are directly uh, responsible as a as a single body. Right, so you are uh, as a university. Each university was incorporated, right, with its own charter, and recognized incorporated, uh, recognized as a body. And so the university was, uh, and, and everyone who was in it was uh, recognized as having direct responsibility for their actions, and at the same time having direct uh, privilege for all the privileges that were listed in the charter. I want to make a, a big shout out to uh, one of our students, um, Callum Harvey, who's who's just written a, a really interesting paper and is going to take up a, an honors topic on this, on the um, the kind of rise of the corporation uh, as a, a, a kind of nation state. But it occurs now in listening to you that they're more like a, a city state. See, the corporations today, the big difference is that they are all limited liability. The medieval period did not know this kind of concept of limited liability. Right. Uh, what does this mean? Very important. This is the, pretty much the most important distinction uh, 
uh, and the most important, uh, um, you know, small text at the bottom of uh, <laughs> uh, any any uh, description of corporations. What does this mean? It means that uh, if in the case of uh, um, any anything bad happening uh, of whatever nature, the um, stockholders, uh, the stakeholders of the corporation are not liable for any of the damages that yeah. the corporation has generated. And hence, we have the craziness of, uh, of uh, modernity as we know it today. Uh, this was not known. The notion of uh, limited liability is completely heretical and, and alien to, to the medieval uh, Europe. It quite the opposite. Right. So very often, um, let's mm. say if someone, uh, uh, let's say a cart with a, a donkey pulling a cart and the cart would uh, drive over uh, someone's leg, um, the donkey was directly responsible and donkeys would be, uh, you know, there would be a trial and uh, the animal would be executed for causing damages or, or punished. And the punishment would be all exactly the same as the punishment to a human. Um, With the driver or the... Yeah, if, the dri yeah. if there was a driver, the driver would be punished as well. Yeah. Uh, there was no such thing as no liability. Everyone yeah, is liable. Everyone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas uh, the, the, the FedEx truck that... that oh, I shouldn't say... Cool. <laughs> no, but a, a trademark name who owns a, a truck that runs over someone... Uh, the, the shareholders have no responsibility because of this limited liability clause. Exactly. So while there is a kind of uh, historical echo, the the, the legal um, arrangements around the that. The legal uh, arrangements have changed spectacularly. Yeah. And they changed, uh, it, and this is the rise of the modern period. Uh, with, they changed with the first global modern corporation, which is the East India, the Dutch East, East India, India Company. Company. But to go back, though, you, you did say that um, when a city-state forms, they are petitioning the king to put aside the, the laws. Charter. The ch it's, it's not laws. Uh, they define their own laws. They get a charter. So uh, what this means is that the, there is a, this is an official document from the highest authority. So the highest authority is always the king, which recognizes this uh, specific... Um, parameters of that entity. That might be a city-state, it might be a university. All universities started exactly in the same way. It might be a guild, yeah. um, um, which, which uh, is, is allowed to operate in this way from now on, right? So they start as, um, um, as, as chartered in this way. And certain charters ended up acting as a uh, ready template. So for example, Within the and when I, for those of you who don't understand, I mentioned Holy Roman Empire, and uh, this has nothing to do with the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire collapsed. The Holy Roman Empire formed in the territory of what is now Central Europe. So this is uh, what is now Germany, Austria, Poland, uh, or rather Southern Poland, uh, Czechia, Slovakia, Hungary. So this is uh, on Northern Italy. So this is the territory of the Holy Roman Empire from medieval Europe. So, um, like I said, certain charters ended up um, becoming almost like templates for successful city chartering. So in, in the Holy Roman Empire, this was known as the Magdeburg model. So the charter that the Holy Roman Emperor gave to Magdeburg was so consider, considered to be so successful to allow the city to prosper and the citizens to, to uh, you know, live there. So that it started being copied en masse. So you have, you have in Poland, uh, if you go to... to Poland to southern Poland to uh, western Poland, and you look at all of these cities which started, literally cities would start from, from you, you had nothing there, and then a bunch of uh, merchants, craftsmen, or just random citizens or runaway peasants would uh, form, literally start building shacks, and then uh, they would directly petition uh, the, the Holy Roman Emperor, or the Chancellor rather, uh, they, they wouldn't write to the emperor directly <laughs> to to get the Magdeburg Charter, and it would be automatically given. And so they they organize themselves on the Magdeburg model, and it's, in fact they start looking the same even. This is this is software. This exactly, is, this exactly. Is the, it's, it's the, protocol. The name show. Yeah. This is this is the meme. I'm just <laughs> I can just see all these connections there. It's a, it's a it's a it's a format, a template that, that's that's ready to go. 
And once you have the necessary yeah. preconditions there, you, you have an API, boom, boom, it's yeah. done. <laughs> and, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's working, right? Because uh, you have um, a recognition of the city as a um, se- territory separate from the surrounding land. This is but really the, important. But the city couldn't, the, the, like, for example, you couldn't say in the city, the, the leaders of the city couldn't say, okay, well, okay, sedition against the king is going to be okay in the city. You couldn't w- openly work against no, the No, no. So, so uh, you sedition against uh, the royal body, because remember, the king is not... So that's something that has to be explained also. So the king is never a person. This notion of the person is also a, model, a modern uh, understanding. The king is always the royal body. And so any, uh, uh, any uh, attack, whether in uh, physical or verbal against the royal body is uh, th- there's a f- term from French which is used uh, uh, universally is called lesser majesté which means uh, lessening literally of the majesty of the royal body and the, the idea here is not that the king is a special person uh, everyone knew back then that people were extremely smart so everyone knew that uh, uh, you know the king might be a, a total disaster the point is that uh, the king was the fulcrum, the capstone holding the entire structure of medieval society together. Yeah. Right? And so it was really important to have that in place. So Lesse Majesté was the worst possible crime in uh, in uh, medieval society. So it was the harshest punishment. There's a famous case. Um, uh, which city was that? I think it was Lille in, in northern France. So this is uh, in the late 14th century. So uh, the context here is that you have the the Black Death has passed, so that's 1348. Uh, 50% everywhere between, so it depends, but, but between 30 to 70% of I've the population heard, yeah, has died. 60, 65%. Yeah. Often D- depending, yeah. depending. Where, d- where, where you are, right. Dense urban areas would, right. would like Florence like lost more than 90% of yeah. its population, right? Northern Italy was devastated, absolutely. Yeah. So this is the end of the medieval for, yeah. for uh, uh, Italy. Um, and then you have, uh, and, and this, by the way, w- is what allowed the appearance of these massive uh, riches in, uh, in magnates and oligarchs in Italy, like the Medici and the Renaissance. The, exactly. The wealth. Exactly. This is what allowed this uh, concentration of wealth, the yeah. Black Dead. Uh, the Renaissance wouldn't exist without it. And uh, uh, so you have Lille. And this city rebelled against the French king. Why? Because the French king introduced a tax which was not in the charter. And the tax was 12% uh, income tax. And the French king needed... GST. The, uh, uh, yeah, GST of, of all trade. Oh, trade so the, yeah. And the, there was no GST before that. So the, the French king introduced a 12% uh, GST uh, and because uh, and there was a reason given, of course, because of the 100 years was to fight the English. Yeah. But Lille rebelled. And so the entire city was accused of lesser majesty. And it was terribly punished. So uh, the, all of the, the leading citizens were executed. Oh, and, wow. and, but the point is that everyone knew that this is the, the, going to be the punishment for it. And yet the city still rebelled because of the introduction of a GST, of a sales tax. It was not in the charters, right? So the king, the king broke his word and rebellion followed. Anyways. I think it was um, I think it was Douglas Adams who who said the only thing faster than the speed of light is the speed of kings. <laughs> <laughs> when one king dies, the next king is automatically the king, regardless of where they are. Yeah, long live the king. The king is dead. Long live the king. It's instantaneous. There's no temporal <laughs> change, challenge there at all. So the thing, and and let's move on because we can yeah. keep talking about the the thing I wanted to point out for for everyone listening who still is maybe not aware of this is that the medieval period was, uh, in many respects, uh, would be for us from uh, from a uh, kind of humanistic perspective, um, much more recognizable and uh, one with which we could empathize much more than uh, any other period between now and then, literally. Uh, certainly not the Renaissance, which was actually a horrible time to be uh, to be to be living in Europe. It was uh, a, a nightmare dystopia of constant warfare, brigandage, uh, total exploitation, religious extremism, uh, uh, religious extremism, uh, uh, turbo religious extremism, the the Inquisition uh, uh, working overtime and uh, persecution of everything and everyone. It was total nightmare. This is the the 
the numbers on the, the like the burning of witches and the burning of heretics anyone who had knowledge it started it that's the other thing the the burning of witches actually started in Europe in the 15th century yeah. after the medieval period yeah, was yeah. over because witches yeah. were were celebrated in the early medieval because that's where knowledge and an understanding of, of herbal, you know, her, you the, know the, the, medicines. This is actually much deeper. I'm I'm really passionate about this topic. <laughs> witches, <laughs> witches uh, were part of um, of uh, the daily life and of um, folk culture in uh, throughout Europe uh, because they were pre pre Christian, right? So these are pre Christian phenomena. It's Christianity that uh, demonized uh, the role of women in society. And they were of uh, so they, you had witchers and witches, mm-hmm. right? And um, and that's not the term they would have used. It, and like, uh, so it's interesting in English you have this pejorative uh, dark term, whereas in yeah. the Slavic uh, languages, uh, in in both in Polish and in I think Slovak and in in Russian as well, uh, the root for which in, in the um, for example in Polish is vejma. That's the word for which in Russian is vejma. Uh, the root is ved, which means not to know. So these were the women who know. Literally, the know, they were the knowers. Yeah. And for men, it's vejmin or vedun in Russian. So again, it's the, the, the man who knows. So these were the people you would go to for, um, for medicine or for, to, to tell you, uh, uh, you know, for astrology, for, to, to give you love potions and everything in between, right? So these were doctors, herbalists, psychologists, uh, and religious figures all in one. Um, and, and so the, um, the medieval still knew them, uh, and they were, they were spread across uh, Europe, and these were established practices. And uh, it's only with the arrival of uh, uh, modernity that we have the, the, you know, the, the horrors that followed. Marsha McLuhan um, uh, described uh, the, 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 the role of knowledge in, in the medieval um, as the ability to overcome the difficulties of life, so you know, you know, ailments, births, where to find, you know, um, you know, what mushrooms at what time of mm-hmm. year, like all the all the um, uh, all the kind of crucial information of how to how to live through the year, but also the crucial information about problem solving, the having of ideas. See, that's the thing. It was uh, knowledge was always already immersed in the material, in the, in living. And uh, even what would normally pass uh, today as an extremely abstract knowledge, the kind of knowledge that was discussed in, in universities, was always inserted in the material as well. Yes. Right. So this is what later in the in the in the Renaissance period and the so-called re- age of reason to follow, or rather age of total and reason, uh, was uh, 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 was kind of pejoratively named as you know medieval scholasticism. Right. Actually, this was. The, the what McLuhan describes as knowledge, which is always immersed in the practical, right? How to live? Okay, uh, what does this mean in terms of living, on, in the everyday? Not what does this mean about being, but what does this mean about your problem right now? Yeah, and and it's connected to the pejorative that that, that uh, it's it's lost its 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 pejorative a little bit lately, but the knowledge in the arts and crafts, and. We've lost the importance of arts and crafts in the daily life because that was where that knowledge and that problem-solving ability was. You know how to build a shelf, how to build a door frame, how to, how to smell, how to produce a pot, and and uh, something else. Also, there is a celebration in the medieval period uh, of life as uh, a process lived through. Making, so life as something that you uh, n- is you're not just drifting through life as a, a individuated consumer, right? So this this would be meaningless notions in a medieval society. You are uh, first and foremost already born in as part of a structure. So you might be as part of a clan uh, in a village, uh, or as as part of a guild in a city, right? If, if for most people this was the reality, very few people were actually. In the nobility, uh, in in Western Europe, it was between one and three uh, percent only the nobility. The rest were, you know, either peasants or uh, citizens. And uh, you would be always already immersed in uh, a very rich support network of relationships 
um, uh, between communities and within communities, right? Um, the state did not uh, engage in uh, this. First, the notion of the state did not exist, right? The king would support, uh, it was expected to support himself or the queen herself, right? In the, when uh, king, the queen was in power uh, from their own lands, right? So there was no, this, this notion of the state needing to tax everyone continuously in order to support its uh, existence did, did, not, uh, did not exist at all. Um, when you tell this to people, again, people disbelieve you, but uh, uh, because you have this notion that has been uh, in, in injected in people's minds that this is some sort of dark time of, of, of horrors, uh, the medieval peasant, right, the supposed oppressed medieval peasant had in different countries, it varies, but between 200 and 250 free days in the year, <laughs> right? So I repeat this for everyone. Between 200 and 250 days in a 365-day year. <laughs> Right, so these were all sorts of feasts for local saints and uh, uh, universal Christian saints. These were festivities uh, associated with uh, this or that uh, celebration of this or that uh, time of the year. Uh, these were local fairs, etc., etc., etc. And, and sure, there were elements of you know life being tough. There were periods of, of famine and periods of disease and 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 uh, you know smaller wars and things like that. But on the whole, life at life was in so incredibly different to what we understand. It's being very. Today. So most people would uh, rarely travel anywhere, um, but uh, there were many. People who were, uh, would be uh, uh, traveling all over uh, their country, and you know, the, again, remember that there was no such thing as countries back then. So, uh, what would now be recognized, let's say, as, as France or, or Germany, oh, yeah. um, and uh, uh, often people would be traveling on, on going on insane voyages. Uh, they were usually pu- for uh, as a pilgrimage, right? So, the most popular pilgrimages within Europe were to go to. Uh, so the most popular of all was uh, the Santiago de Compostela one in Spain. So they would go on these um, uh, months and months of, of uh, walking on foot to go through the Pyrenees into what is now uh, northwestern Spain to, uh, to, to visit the uh, Church of Santiago in, in Compostela. Would, would, would people pack up their families? Would, yeah, they would a, yeah. go, they, and, and they would go not as one person. Again, yeah. remember this notion of yeah. the individual, is, is as we that, know yeah. it now, as the, <laughs> as the anxiety-ridden, uh, stress-ridden, uh, uh, individuated, atomized uh, suburban consumer, is complete insanity from perspective of medieval uh, society because everyone existed as part of not one, but several different communities at least, right? So in uh, in uh, both in villages and in towns, you had fraternities, right, where um, uh, people would be uh, members of this or that uh, uh, fraternity guild, where uh, all the brothers and sisters would be, uh, you know, helping your family if something were to happen to you, yeah. right? They would raise your uh, children, Ch- yeah, right? Yeah, or they yeah. would help your your partner if uh, if they are alone after you passed away. Yeah. So um, you would have this this networks of uh, uh, mutual support, of peer support. Right? So people will be existing, spending their entire life in this kind of environment. Even in the pilgrimage itself, I've, I've read about uh, pilgrims being, you know, spread out in long chains, but also moving like in slower. So slower moving elements would clump together mm-hmm. for safety and, and food preparation. Plus, on top of that, you had so notice we haven't even mentioned uh, the church, right? And the church was an immense part of life. Uh, and in Western Europe, this was the the Catholic Church, and so we we you had the church, and uh, you had the monastic orders, which appeared in the 12th century as a reaction to um, to many things. So, on the one hand, a reaction to um, the need for being acro- uh, among the people, truly among the people. So one of the first orders is now almost forgotten uh, of tremendous importance in European history is the Cistercian order. So these were monks who would go and build their uh, monasteries uh, among the peasants, so far away from uh, uh, towns and cities or centers of power, and they would specialize in uh, agriculture. These so, were working monks. These aren't everyone just was like, working. Yeah, it's not Every, isolated. Yeah. You know, no, 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 no. This this cloister, notion of yeah, yeah. yeah uh, there were cloister orders. Like for example, the Carthusians, they would be locked 
and they will, they will never communicate with anyone, but they will still work, yeah. right? They, they will have to work to support themselves, right? Um, but um, these kind of orders, they would also form a fraternity, right? So they would, always, they would exchange information. So you have information about new agricultural techniques, let's say, traveling from Spain to northern Poland in this way. Uh, but you would also have um, uh, exchange of uh, monks, right? And uh, that's how culture would travel as well. Um, very often, uh, this applied both to, to men and women who found themselves in dire straits, they would join an order. And, uh, and the, the monastic orders would take care of them. So this yeah, was right. yet another welfare network, right? Which, uh, which Something drastic happened. This, yeah. this was a, a safety net that existed that you could still maintain some kind of life and, and contribute. And be part of, see, the, again, I want to repeat this because I think it's a, a really important issue. This notion of being alone. Yeah. Uh, like I read uh, um, an article in the Sydney Morning Herald some time, a few days ago that uh, be, uh, I'm trying to remember now, but I think it was more than 50% of those who are between 20 and 30 in Australia declare that they are either always or mostly always lonely. Right? So you're looking at a 25-year-old person who's supposed to be in the flower of their life, right? Who's supposed to be as connected as possible in our supposedly connected age, <laughs> declaring that they're always on, always lonely, yeah. always alone, right? So this would be completely unthinkable. Yeah, uh, and yet probably very connected, but connected in in very different sense. But feeling lonely, feeling that's lonely. the thing, feeling, experiencing yeah. loneliness. Whereas uh, uh, the medieval uh, European uh, med medieval world uh, does not parse this kind of statement, right? So, so you will never, you, you are always part of something. Uh, you are always part at least of one, if not many different communities. Um, and for those who are of, uh, and, and there was there were all sorts of flavors, if you will. So for example, for those who are of a more militaristic, militant nature, um, uh, they would join the, one of the, especially after the 12th century, after they're forming, one of the monastic uh, militant orders. They would join the Templars, so they would join the Hospitaliers, right? They would go to the Holy Land. So they would both be soldiers and part of a brotherhood, right? And will, will be taken care of, right? They will be part of a community. Um, this, is, this is something uh, which is drastically different about uh, medieval world as compared to us. Even the word community has has been vacated of of its meaning. You know, we, we often hear about community and we're told that we exist in a community, but the the bonds of that community have been enormously eroded and see, dissolved. The old limited liability. <laughs> That's the thing. You see, when you talk about community, unfortunately, you're right. Yeah. When, when you talk about community, uh, again, from a medieval perspective. Uh, you always have total skin in the game, 100%. So you're a member of the community means that if someone happens to this person over here, you, you'll be taking care of them. Yeah. But if something happens to you, they will be taking care of you, right? And there's no ifs and buts. That's, that's how it was, right? So um, the societies were forming this kind of networks of interrelated being, right, of mutual entanglement, uh, and it, it was really interesting in the in the high medieval period, in the 12th and the early 13th century, you had uh, the 13th century considered the apogeum of, of medieval Europe, uh, which also, by the way, for climactic reasons was the apogeum. It was a very mild, much warmer than today uh, climate in Europe. Europe was very, very much warmer. Um, uh, people were growing grapes in Iceland in the 13th century, uh, if you want to wonder how, how warm it was. Uh, Life Ericsson, uh, was growing wheat in Greenland, and he called it Greenland because of that. He was the discoverer of Greenland, right? right? So, uh, and it it all uh, changed in the early 14th century when the climate changed, um, and uh, you know the Greenland communi Viking community collapsed. Right? Iceland uh, stopped producing grapes and and wheat, right? The, uh, the agriculture collapsed there as well. So, anyways. The uh, during that period in the in the twelfth uh, and, and in the thirteenth um, century, you had uh, all sorts of uh, situations where, let's say, a peasant runs away from uh, uh, because uh, we haven't mentioned this. So we have uh, 
the peasants, how they operated. Right. So you had yep. different types, different types of uh, uh, being a peasant. So you had uh, the uh, the worst type, which is the bonded servant peasant. Right. So these are people who uh, you could think of them as people who are in an eternal mortgage. Right. So you are you are imagine yourself repaying your house in a, in, a, in somewhere in modern Australia suburbia, but your mortgage is not for thirty years. Or maybe it is for your life, your lifetime, yeah. <laughs> right? And so you're constantly paying, or you are, it might as well just be call your, calling yourself a renter, right? But the thing is that you are obliged to be paying, right? So you're bonded to that land, so you're obliged to be paying, uh, and it was different, but between ten and thirty percent of your uh, output, so income, to the feudal lord. And Unlike you, a mortgage, though, that. You, you can travel. You can. You can. No, you cannot. Stuff, so this but, is bonded. But, bonded. But, yes, but you bonded, cannot move. You yeah. can't. Yeah, you have. You have no autonomy or agency yeah, you, of, of freedom of movement. Exactly. You, you have to get up. You have to work. You have to labor, and so, you don't get to re- get the benefits of that labor. You you get them, but you don't keep them all, right? You keep between. Uh, so you you had to give to your lord between ten and thirty percent. Right. Right. So thirty percent was in the the highest tax rate in medieval Europe, and it was considered other usually and uh, people usually rebel and attack their lords or commit lesser majesty, right? Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Compared to to, yeah. to current situation, so the now, usually it was ten, and this is where the in, in Eastern Europe usually in a, in all countries you have it even as a word describing the tenor. It's called the Jishin China, let's say, which means the 10% tax that you have to pay. Everyone hated the tenor. <laughs> now imagine you only, your tax is only 10%. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so it, it, these were the worst, right? The people who were bonded to the land. But the majority were not like that, though. And very often, lords, especially in times of hardship, for example, after the Black Dead, would themselves go and beg the peasants to stop being bonded. Uh, and to become free peasants. They would give them land holdings as free peasants. Why? Because free peasants would have much more interest to produce more. Mm. Yeah. They, w- they would keep more. So the Lord over a, a certain time period would be making much more, actually. So the majority of the peasants were actually free. It's a long tail. Free peasants, exactly. And within the free peasants, you had the free who are landholders. So they had their own their land, and they would be owning, owing a, a tiny amount of, uh, let's say, 1% or 2% to the, to the Lord, and they would, then you would have the free renters. So they will be renting lar- land from the Lord and will be still giving, uh, let's say, a 10 to or 15% tax to the Lord, but they will be free. They can move at any time, right? Why am I saying all of this? Because it was interesting how peasants, there was an established practice that if a peasant, doesn't matter whether bonded, free, or ha- landholder, etc., if a peasant arrives in a chartered city and stays for one year and a day, he becomes he or she becomes a citizen, citizen. Yeah. and they cannot be persecuted anymore because lords will try and chase uh, and for for uh, let's say bonded peasants who have run away, and that's the other problem with bonded peasants they would run away, right? What what do they have to lose? Nothing. And you've got to spend money to catch exactly. them and return them, and if you don't get them in that time, you lose that investment. One of the um, one of the things that were also common, I think it, it's towards the middle and, and, and late medieval period, is the importance of the commons. And so this is this is types of land. Some it's not owned by anyone. Some of it is some of these lands are owned by a lord. Um, so you weren't you weren't allowed to poach. You weren't allowed to go and shoot deer or mm. or, um, or boar, but you could bring your boar and you could let them roam free yeah. in in that commons space um you could uh i think you, you could collect firewood but not cut down trees so again depends it all depends yeah. on the on the country and the uh, historical period but the, the the main concept here is the concept of the commons yeah. in, in which everyone can come and go from and make use of in in different ways and towards the end of the medieval period, and particularly in the Renaissance, we see the rise of the surveyor, whose job it is to come in 
and to measure and to divide up mm. and to fun, uh, manage the funding of walls in order to build out and then sell so that the Lord could then sell um, titles of ownership of this land. And that, and that ended the way of living on the land. It's uh, absolutely. The, the thing with the commons is really interesting because yeah, these were – uh, organically, uh, like self-managed, self-organized by the community, and everyone understanding that it's really important that this land is held in common, uh, because this is the only way. Where, for example, uh, imagine a village, and everyone in the village, which used to be, by the way, in Eastern Europe, the practice all the way until the early 20th century, where every family in the village would have around 100 sheep. So imagine a village of uh, 500 families. And everyone with uh, uh, 100 sheep, so we have what, 50,000 sheep, right? So uh, it's, it's tremendously hard to, to manage this if you don't have a common land on which you have the grazing happening, right? So everyone understood that it's, it's of fundamental importance to have uh, land in common. So and when that disappeared, and it was disappeared on purpose, right, as you point out, and it was disappeared by force, yep. right, because this, this land was not... Uh, recognized as owned by the Lord. So it was not a, the Lord's local Lord's prerogative or the king's prerogative to take it. Again, it depends where you were, but, exactly. but for the majority, yeah. So when uh, this started, so when it started happening in England to in order to fund foreign adventures and fleets and, and the Nassim Empire, right, you had the disappearance of the, the village, yeah. the destruction of uh, the countryside life. Particularly the cutting down of trees yeah. to, to, to build boats and to um, support the war effort devastated the countryside because you could no longer, you know, have areas where sheep could be protected, you know, in storms and things like that. So then you have to start building sheds and you have to start building fences. And, and, you know, when you had that, when you had these mass numbers of of livestock, you could, you could um, collectively get together to pay for shepherds to to watch over the entirety of the flock, but you can't afford to do that. For your own smaller flock, so they get picked off by um, uh, wool uh, foxes, mainly the, the, mm. the lambs, but also wolves in some areas. You, you can't pay to manage them all the time, so then you have to start building <laughs> more barns, and and just this whole process of devolution, 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 yeah. and of the and all of these bonds that we mentioned earlier, uh, these entanglements in the community, they devolved. And we live now in a time, so look around you and, and again, think of this epidemic of loneliness, of, of uh, isolation, uh, of, of constant anxiety. Um, we live in the time basically at the bottom of that process of devolution. This is a, a, a good segue because I think we'll come back and we'll talk about the, maybe the kind of reinvigoration of, of the medieval um, in a little minute because, because I want to kind of point out another devolution that we see starting to happen uh, in the 14th century and that is the the rise of the printing press which leads to the existence of books and um, Terence McKenna writing about uh, Marshall McLuhan um, talks about the the book as the emergence of the er product right the ur product the the original mass produce product that becomes then the model for every other mass production of product because you you get the the invention of the movable type printing press in the in the in the 14th century 15 14 15 sorry yeah. thank you but, and and it does take it it takes 100 200 years for it to fully dispersed no, it, it became throughout a, Europe. It, it does, but uh, from from when the Gutenberg started in 1455 to you can count 50 years to not 50, to be precise uh, it's uh, 64 years to the Luther uh, nailing his protest to, to a, a cathedral door and basically the Protestant revolution and the, the beginning of the religious wars in Europe which were entirely and only the product of the printing press, so it's it it took less than a like slightly more than half a century, right? Uh, less than a century, for, certainly, and uh, definitely the book as a mass. I totally agree with McKenna. It, it's as a mass produced, um, the first mass produced uh, product, the first commodity. 
He describes it at the book as setting the model for the production, consumption, distribution, and standardization of knowledge, learning, culture, art, and essentially being. Yeah, the assembly line knowledge. There's a great quote from um, Marshall McLuhan in the Gutenberg Galaxy where he says, print in turning the vernaculars into mass media or closed systems created the uniform centralized forces of modern nationalism. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and, and this is one of the things that I thought was fantastic because you know, we've talked so much about the university, but the university before books is an oral culture. It's, you have these instances where scholars are reading aloud from manuscripts to a collective audience. And, and this has been sterilized as the lecture now that, that students are rebelling against. But um, it was this amazing uh, uh, – universities were loud and noisy and, and chaotic. Com communal. And com exactly. They were very chaotic, anarchistic uh, environments. And uh, hence, a girl, the Amos Higitu, right? They were, again, remember, there were no books. There were no printed books. So they were all, like we pointed out, they were all manuscripts which are copied by hand only, right? So they're rare. They're valuable. Um, and they're not just written words. They're, they're illustrated and they're, they're beautiful um, they're beautiful works of art that aren't just read. And this is the thing I love about McLuhan, right? Um, that, that you have to look at a manuscript, rather than simply read a manuscript and you have to absorb it. See, they were illuminated, right? So this is the word, the, the, the people who were, um, I wanted to say illustrating them, but they were not illustrators. They were known as illuminators, right? And when you think about the etymology of that word, so they, they, were, they were shedding light literally on, on the paper, on the vellum. Uh, what's really interesting when it comes to this is that uh, there was a very fascinating synergy between uh, monasteries and universities because uh, the, the the big scriptoria across Europe, and scriptorium is uh, literally what uh, um, we now call uh, the library. Uh, so the big, the big scriptoria across Europe were invariably in the monasteries. And so this is where also the uh, the big copying was happening. So when a lord or when a university wanted to have uh, um, a, a, a manuscript copied, they would go to the monastery where, you know, this, uh, you had monks whose entire life was spent copying, right? So this is what they were doing. This was their form of prayer. And uh, uh, there was a synergy between the two, between uh, uh, monasteries and universities where the, the monasteries would feed the universities with, uh, with scripts. Um, so this is beautiful because um, I'm going to return to McLuhan for a sec because McLuhan saw the electronic age as the revival of, of the, the Middle Ages, the medieval, the return to the medieval value. He describes it as a re-entering of a world of multisensorial perception, not as a return to the past but as a kind of super future. And I think it's fantastic that our library and libraries around the world in universities are slowly removing their books and increasing facilities for uh, maker spaces, for um, audio production spaces, um, in order to, to produce knowledge within a, a multi-sensorial experience. Do you remember the Google uh, project? I forgot already what it was called. Project, I forgot already. It wasn't Gutenberg, something else. They were, so this happened in the... I think 2011 or 2012, and they got shut down very quickly by Publishers. Uh, whatever administration was back then, basically threatened, and uh, and obviously by the United Front of Publishers. Uh, Google wanted to copy each and every printed book and share it uh, in the open. I think they got through a good chunk, and they invented entirely new print uh, scanning scanning, te yeah. scanning technologies. But uh, this got eventually shut down. The I was really excited about that because this. Uh, when you when you were talking about copying and about the electronic uh, age and, and uh, specifically if you think about the internet and digital media, the internet is very much uh, a medieval medium um, because of that sharing uh, of knowledge. Uh, like Kevin Kelly likes to say, it's, it's a, the internet is a river of copies. Um, uh, the, the medieval age understood uh, only this type of uh, uh, media, right? The, the medium as a river of copies. Um, the medieval age did not understand authorship. 
uh, as, as the way we know it. And uh, or God forbid, copyright. Copyright didn't exist as a concept at all back then. Uh, no one could think of anything like that. So uh, uh, anything so, so uh, monstrous. So the um, when uh, and we know now after uh, you know centuries of textual analysis that this such and such uh, medieval philosopher actually was the originator of this concept, right? So uh, they would never dare to call themselves the authors and originators. They would say upon authority, <laughs> uh, uh, understood uh, the authorities of the ancient uh, authorities, uh, such as you know Plato, Aristotle, or the Church Fathers, right? So it's uh, they were viewed as the authorities out of which the knowledge flows. So you, the author, would never presume that you are actually the author of this idea. You just you have maybe tweaked it a little bit at most, right? Uh, but it comes from a higher authority back in the in the mythological past, right? Because these were mythological figures at that stage. It's like the you know the miller with the water mill on the side of the river would never imagine that they're the source of the, the river. <laughs> yeah, a, yeah, exactly. It's a naturally exactly. flowing thing yeah. that, that that they're just tapping into in order to to distribute. McLuhan saw, um, and I love the fact that you think the the internet is a kind of medieval device because, or a medieval media. McLuhan saw um, television as uh, a return to the manuscript, that it was something that uh, was illuminated. Mm. It was finally free from these artificial restrictions of the printed page, and it was something that required looking, not reading. And it's actually McKenna. Uh, talks about um, the the importance of children's books in children learning to read. Right, children don't learn to read from reading; they learn to read from looking at illustrated Illustrate, manuscri- yeah. manuscripts. Yeah. And then, after thousands of times of looking, they start to associate the the, words the, phon- and, yeah. the phonetics, and then transition in into reading mm. and. Um, you know, you know, I'm a massive uh, audiobook fan and, and or podcasts, and and um, I've realised just how much of an audio learner I, I've been, and I've only just realised this recently. And uh, you know, definitely been sharing my audiobooks with my kids, and and one of them is is definitely a print reader, and one of them is definitely an audio reader. Or I mean, reading it doesn't even mm. make any sense to call it reading, but knowledge learner through the audial and the internet takes this to the to the ninth level the uh, M- McLuhan says the most perfect medium is the invisible medium and the internet is the invisible medium yeah, absolutely. it is the perfect medium because it is this multi-sensorial experience you have image you have text you have audio you have video with games you have performance you have community you have interaction and it is um in my mind, the, the, the internet is, seems a lot like the medieval fair. It is this. It is, it is very much a fair, fair like. And, and it's, uh, in its, I remember vividly when the internet first appeared, uh, and, and my first encounters in the mid '90s with the internet was it had a very carnivalesque uh, f- uh, um, kind of festival-like uh, feel to it. Uh, you know, you were excited just to be there. It's exactly like at, at the fair. We, we we go together to medieval fairs. So you know exactly how a fair is supposed to look. Everything is upbeat, and you're just looking for the next strange, weird thing to appear. So this is this is a great segue because Ted and I are both um, big fans of the the medieval fairs um, in Australia and in in New South Wales. We're fortunate that we have the the Winterfest, the St Ives. But I was doing a, I was doing a bit of a web search and, and, and looking around. There's the Blacktown City Festival, Iron Fest in Lithgow. That's Lithgow, I th- yeah. I think we have to go to that one year. Um, there's a Tasmanian medieval festival in October, so it's completely incompatible with our mm. – but I would love to go and check that out. The Timeline Festival in Victoria. In, and in Victoria, it even has its own proper castle. They have um, Cryle Castle that was built by Keith Ryle. And you can go and learn all about, uh, you know, knights and mm. um, medieval living, uh, smithing. Uh, I'm so we're so <laughs> so doing that next year. But um, all of these fairs are the the, the pop, their popularity and certainly how you know, I came to know about them and, and, and be interested in them is via the internet. You know, this, these are in, entirely enabled by um, communities 
who are able to communicate across Facebook, who are able to have their own websites and their own presences and share their knowledge to an audience and celebrate. They would be impossible without the internet. Remember? See, the thing, this is where um, I, uh, I think that it's not that I disagree with McLuhan, but he, when he's talking about uh, television, he is uh, he's looking as, at the uh, manuscript as a surface. But uh, what he's missing is that uh, actually television is much much closer, in my opinion, to the experience of uh, um, the Sunday Mass. So uh, t- because the medieval community would uh, invariably, as it, everyone, it was a very religious, uh, infused with belief community, so uh, people would be going for, for Sunday Masses. And, uh, you know, you had the illuminated windows, right? And uh, so people, the, co- the commoners would be standing, right? Only the, the rich who would pay for, uh, you know, sitting, would be sitting, or the big lords would be sitting right next to where the priests were. But the commoners would be standing or, or sitting down, um, and uh, would be spending often, um, you know, half a day or more just standing there and chatting. And uh, um, uh, there was trade in the temples, even though the church uh, very much didn't like it. Uh, and in front of the temples, usually fair uh, markets were uh, right in front of the temple as well, uh, for obvious reasons, because that's where everyone is going, right? So <laughs> we might as well just sell them something, right? Uh, and usually the, the public entertainment was there as well. Uh, any sort of public uh, um, penalties, punishments for criminals were also right in front. So if you go to old cathedrals in uh, Europe, you would see uh, they would have these big iron chains often, or there would be some uh, uh, like a, like a uh, stone pole right in front with iron chains protruding out. This would this would be where criminals would be tied to for for punishment. And again, the idea is that this is all part of that visual experience, the visual life of the community as a whole, right? So the community comes in and consumes all of that. So this is where te- television very much fits in. But what's interesting with the internet is that it captures, to my uh, mind, much more, much better the experience of uh, the medieval experience of that uh, multiplicities of entanglements, right? So. Um, People would be members of all sorts of different uh, communal organizations, right? We were participating in all sorts of different aspects of the communal life. And uh, uh, this is very much like the internet. Yeah. It's just that on a global scale. Hence, you know, McLuhan, again, the global village. The, um, the Although that was something he was quite critical of and quite he was quite worried about how that would turn out. He was quite concerned that... Um, Everyone having everyone invested in everyone's business beyond the surface. So you know, like the nosy neighbor, magnified. Uh, this I think. Uh, um, yeah, that's another. I, I think he was overthinking it, perhaps because uh, we we see quite the opposite, in my opinion. I, if only everyone was invested in everyone's business, <laughs> is what I can say. Yes. In fact, we have quite the opposite. Total alienation. <laughs> what, uh, what, but, uh, what I think you were talking about there um, is, is something that I, I, I've written a, a bit about, and, and that is the way in which we exist in several, sometimes hundreds, sometimes occasional, micro publics of existence. So we have these mm-hmm. we have these niche micro publics of existence. You know, your your fandoms, your political interests, your hobbies, your families, and they all circulate around each other and, and they all interact in, in unpredictable and, and interesting ways. And that's how you forge new connections. You're like, oh, you like, and, and this is, you know, people criticize Facebook a lot and people criticize Instagram a lot. But I've seen the importance of, say, um, uh, families of children with disabilities, right, coming together in communities through Facebook because they have liked a service or they've liked a page and Facebook has said you and this person liked this and then they've been able to say you know they've or you know I've you know we've created connections because 
uh, we've liked our children's school page or, or, mm. or, or club or whatever. And then you've been able to form connections and, and you know, can you pick up, you know, what's the name on the way to Taekwondo this week? <laughs> right? and, and, and so Facebook gets a really bad rap, but it, it has enabled these kinds of connections that were not as easily made previously. Uh, in 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 the kind of when I certainly when I was growing up. Yeah, we, I mean, that's the worst time to to grow up is when uh, we fully immersed in the in uh, pre-internet uh, uh, you know modernity, minus the all the the tremendous uh, awesomeness that the internet brought in and the uh, the ability to form new communities and to be part of. Uh, communities on the other end of the world, right? And th- returning back to the medieval affairs, they are only possible here because of uh, of uh, that community building that the internet allows. Um, and we now call them niche communities, right? But um, these are just new, new uh, or different or, or, or various forms of living and being, right? Uh, of, of annotating uh, and illuminating your life, right? In in new ways. Um, ways which are, uh, um, you know, outside of the very limited consumer response of, of this mass society. I think it can be overwhelming, and, and that brings us back to that point that you made before about, about young people feeling isolated and, and feeling lonely, is that when they're so deeply immersed in this, it, it, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel like you don't know where to invest. See, that's the thing. I don't think they're deeply immersed. That's the thing. Yeah, they're disconnected. They're actually not they're, immersed they're, at they're all. They're performative. But, yeah. they're, but they're not immersed. They're not immersed because to be immersed in this context is to be part of, of a community. community. Uh, another platform that gets a, a bad rap that I, that I quite love is Instagram. And what I love so much about Instagram is that it is all looking. Sure, there's a little bit of reading, but it is uh, a, a visually sensorium, a visual sensorium of of looking at at things. And it always always depends on who you follow and how you follow. Um, But I follow a a group um, of Russian LARPers, uh, live action role players. And um, they they recently did did a a 1,000 person LARP um, in in Russia in March in 2019. It was one of the world's largest live action role playing game. And they were recreating one of the famous battles uh, from Warhammer history. And thousands of them in the most incredible costumes, like spending a year building these costumes. They had a working steam tank. They had, they were, there was groups of them animating monsters together. They represented all the different regions from the world. And then they come together to, to battle. Um, I've recently been following. So, um, if you if if you if you're looking for that one, it's um, look for Pablo underscore Engi. Um, uh, he's fantastic. Uh, also on Instagram, um, massive shout out to Medieval Matt. He's an Australian um, cosplayer and medieval recreationist who goes around schools and takes in you know swords and props and lets the kids. Uh, you know, learn learn that. Um, and um, uh, there's another group that, that on Instagram called Fell and Fair, and uh, it's a smaller group, but but they have a number of really uh, professional photographers, so that it looks amazing. They recreate scenes from Lord of the Rings, and. Uh, it, it, it is next level fan. I mean, it's not to, to, to even to say fan it, it is to is to give you a, the wrong kind of impression. This is living, a living community of celebration. Can you notice though that this? I was just thinking while you were explaining this that uh, this is what this is very much what medieval folk art looked like. But today in our uh, terribly stratified uh, society which pretends not to be stratified at all, right? Supposedly it's it's very democratic and egalitarian. <laughs> uh, uh, this would never be called art, right? LARPers are not uh, uh, anything but art, right? They are not artists, supposedly. Uh, whereas uh, in, in the medieval context, this is how folk art looked like, right? Uh, me and you got there and we just started playing or doing these things that we like doing and dressing up and uh, 
performing and this is how theater actually started and the the value in it isn't the final look it's the sharing of the techniques and the open experimentation oh i tried this foam mm -hmm. with this glue and this paint and it didn't work you should try this you know this combination i've seen posts just of endless discussions about the right combination to get flexibility in armor while still having spray silver spray so that it looks authentically metal and the right shade of metal for that period do you know when i found out that because i'm really interested in the medieval armor so when i found out that uh, larping has really started to become a global phenomenon uh, and cosplaying in the context of larping um, when uh, I would go to those medieval armor shops and they are really established medieval armor shops, let's say from uh, the, the best ones uh, in uh, Czech, uh, I was about to say Czech Republic, in Czechia and in Ukraine. This is the most famous armors. Um, and I would go to check out these shops and I would notice they would have an, uh, an entire section on LARPing and LARP armor. <laughs> and, I noticed, and I thought to myself, okay, something serious is happening with these guys. You know, they're... they're, they're um, producing only according to uh, traditional techniques, etc., and they're producing at scale, and they produce a lot of armor. Um, because you have, and this brings us to another topic, The so you have the uh, appearance of the medieval affairs as a, as a modern phenomenon, uh, spurned by the internet. Mm. And then the uh, grassroots, almost overnight rise, organic rise, of an entire ecology of uh, this kind of cottage industries which both supply the fairs but also exist outside of them because of the internet and they can sell to a global audience. So we have armorers and clothes makers and all sorts of different object makers uh, which and these objects, armors, clothes, etc. are uh, recreations of medieval uh, clothing and medieval objects and, uh, and or interpretations of. Yeah. Because uh, some knowledge has been lost. And, and of and course, but you have also the LARPing phenomenon, right? Yeah. And I think they're connected. I, I know, it's, and it's, I find it's, this very fascinating. I mean, LARPing is almost a, just a, a playified version of the, the medieval fair. It, okay, so we unfortunately had a technical issue there, and uh, we lost the last part of the podcast uh, to no fault of our own. Um, thank you, Mac operating system, uh, that we're still learning. Uh, but we... We didn't want to just end uh, the podcast on that note. We wanted to, to circle back around and, and just cover some of the, the points that we were concluding with. And one of the, the things that we were kind of talking um, as we kind of concluded that the podcast was the medieval fair and the mixture of fantasy and um, uh, historic historicism i don't know historical replication historical reenactment reenactment yeah. that's a much better term thank you and uh i i was sharing a, an anecdote that um occurred at the last saint ives fair that that, that really meant uh, it really meant a lot to me because it, it 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 really solidified in my mind just how much of a a generosity is involved in in the people's times like so much so much of people's time is spent um developing the knowledge and the expertise and the practice not just on their own but in talking to each other and then bringing this to the fair and showing it off to a a public as we mentioned before who may be very um badly educated in in, in history and the the, the St. Ives Fair and the, and the Winterfest and the medieval fairs in Australia are this lovely overlap of fantasy and, and history reenactment. And I, I, I was passing by two, two guys who were kind of sitting down and observing people coming in through the entrance in St. Ives. And there were, there were two young women. They came in and they were, they were dressed in very kind of you know, cheap off-the-shelf off the uh, costumes and they were both wearing elf ears, which my daughter thought was fantastic. And the young guy said, oh, you know, that's not historical reenactment. And, and the old guy said, no, it's dress up and they're very welcome. And I just love that. It, to me, it, it just cemented the importance of that day. It was, was, wasn't about policing 
notions of historical realism. It wasn't about um, rejecting anyone's ideas of, 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 of this mix of his, history and fantasy together, but this total acceptance of whatever, whatever you want to bring to this event, there is a space and a location here where you can do that. See, that's the thing that um, I find really uh, amazing about the fair as a concept and uh, the fair as uh, a space is that it, uh, even in medieval times, it was um, uh, a separate space from, uh, from the surrounding land, right? It was uh, uh, like chartered as an independent space for a limited time period, let's say a week. Uh, and and uh, it was special through that, uh, and um, it was special for for all aspects of life. So that's the other thing about the medieval that you have uh, all aspects of life coexisting um, in in the same space, and that, and that being normalized. So you had um, you had commerce, and then you had uh, entertainment. Uh, you had uh, uh, preachers coming to fairs, and then you had jousting, right? Um, and and uh, you had all the different craftsmen from a region coming to sell their wares and to show their skills. So um, uh, it, it was a very much uh, the, the highlight of a community's uh, uh, year uh, of the communal life. And the fairs were usually organized uh, in specific periods, uh, key key holidays or key periods in the year, let's say in, in around the solstices and the equinoxes, right? And, um, uh, you know, a community would live from literally from fair to fair. Um, but uh, we need to uh, wrap up. So I just wanted to say uh, for, for everyone who is listening and who hasn't watched any uh, medieval movies, uh, I don't know whether such people exist, but you know, <laughs> they might, um, uh, or, uh, a, or maybe you're keen to watch a movie which is really authentic. So I highly recommend... Uh, um, Ridley Scott's uh, Kingdom of Heaven uh, with Orlando Bloom. Um, just make sure you you watch the director's cut, right? Not the cinematic version of the director's cut. I've seen the cinematic. What's the director's cut? The director's cut is an additional. I'm not sure whether 30 or 40 minutes. Oh. Uh, a lot of content was uh, he was forced by the distributor to, to, to cut out a lot of content, which damaged uh, the story, basically, and uh, um, removed a lot of the richness and context from, uh, um, from, from the, the, the film and from the way you, you experience the film. Uh, and, and the worst part is that they, he was forced to cut from across the film, so uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, story has just been disappeared. Uh, highly recommend the director's cut. Awesome. I've got that to look forward to. Um, cool. Uh, speaking of fairs and speaking of jousts, there was that Heath Ledger movie that yeah. uh, you were mentioning. We, we, and, and of course we lost it, but I, I was, I was um, uh, saying about um, the medieval fair and, and just how amazing the joust is. And one of the main reasons to get along to, to one of the medieval fairs is to watch the, the jousting. I won't go over it again, but it is truly amazing. And, and connected to that, which is not historically accurate at all, and it has no bearing because it is a brilliant film and it is so, so entertaining and so much fun. And, uh, you know, forget The Dark Knight because Heath Ledger's best performance is, is in uh, The Knight's Tale. And um, wonderful uh, character work in that movie. Uh, really oh, just... Incredible cinematography of the jousting. I just remembered his name in the film, Ulrich von Jungingen. Yeah, <laughs> von Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein. Yeah, Lichtenstein. Right. Lichtenstein. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, in fact, I like that movie so much. I'm going to go home and watch it again this week. Um, the other thing, if you have a Netflix subscription, or you, you know someone with a Netflix subscription, or you're going to sail the high seas, then uh, you should most definitely check out um, the Last Kingdom. It's in. Uh, it's in. It's just finished up its third season. It has a, a fourth season. It's based on a, a series of books. I think there are five books in the series. I can't remember the name of the author, but but if you if you check out um, the Last Kingdom, this is a, a, an amazing Netflix series. It's uh, it uh, it's really pertinent to what we were talking about because it happens. Um at that period of time when, you know, you had the Roman, the society of Roman England collapsing and the Saxons settling in. 
and uh, the Saxon kingdoms have just managed to kind of set a win and establish some sort of continuity. And then you have a massive wave of Viking settlers coming in and wreaking havoc uh, across uh, uh, the land again. And so you have this clash of cultures, clash of uh, 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 languages, um, clash of religions because the Vikings are pagan. Um, and uh, whereas uh, paganism uh, was kind of, uh, officially at least expunged already from uh, from England, it was uh, uh, you know ruled by the Catholic Church, and then you have uh, tremendous character work, tremendous character work. So you have characters which start as uh, Saxon, uh, and then through uh, not to spoil the movie, through unfortunate series of events, uh, uh, become Viking and yeah. grow up as Viking, yeah. and then have uh, torn Christ loyalties. Is a, is a yeah, yeah, and and. Uh, Neither here nor there, right? In between worlds, in the liminal space, as it were. So it's it's a great uh, series. I can't I can't recommend it highly enough. It's worth rewatching. Um, um, it, my son was very disappointed when the third season finished. <laughs> He's like, "When is the fourth season coming out?" Hopefully, it's early next year. Um, it's usually around March, April. And speaking of which, and let's and let's finish on that note. I was just thinking that. Uh, how how amazing it is that uh, the return of the medieval is uh, not only as a, a concept and not only as a flavor, if you will, of media, but uh, as much more as a, a full, fully self-formed kind of self-sovereign cultural phenomenon, right? The, the medieval is uh, is a world. Right? It's not a flavor, it's not a fashion, it's not an aesthetic, it's a, full, it's a fully functioning world. And the, the, the medieval has returned with a vengeance. Uh, and we see that, we, we've seen that already with uh, the tremendous success that uh, Tolkien had and, and uh, uh, the tremendous, tremendous success of uh, fantasy uh, literature and uh, fantasy games. But uh, what, what I wanted to point out is that the emergence of a series or the collapse of, of uh, the, the Hollywood industry in the in the context of you know one-off movies and the emergence of the series streamed online uh, over the internet as a new medium has kind of allowed uh, the medieval to to enter the popular imagination. So we have the Game of Thrones is a phenomenon, uh, which was this is a medieval world, right? That's that's par excellence full-on medieval. Um, uh, universe, if you will, that uh, J.R.R. Martin uh, have created. And uh, and then we have uh, The Last Kingdom and uh, now we have the new Netflix series which is coming, which is The Witcher. The Witcher. Which yeah. is also a medieval world. And it's not accidental that the medieval has returned uh, uh, with vengeance in the popular imagination. And it's not just that The, the Witcher is probably the greatest uh, RPG of the last 10 years. Um, we've seen a return of classic RPGs on, on new platforms. Neverwinter Nights has just been re-released on the Switch. Um, uh, there's a, a Divinity Original Sin. There are amazing RPG games out there at the moment. I, I look forward to the future of the medieval. I think um, one of the things that we'll start to see is, is the notion of the medieval um, open up a bit further and, and we'll start to see other cultures that, that we don't typically... Um, Recognize as being medieval, the the, the Asian, the, the the Latin American, the the even the indigenous, um, you know, populations really open up into the medieval space. Can I tell you that uh, there is a phenomenon in China? Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, it was taken on board and supported by the Communist Party Youth Organization. Of so young people, so people in their teens and twenties, dressing up in traditional Chinese costume and just on, in their daily routine, right? So they are walking around in uh, Han costumes from uh, 1,800 to 2,000 years ago. That's what I'm talking about. And and uh, so so you have the medieval returning within a larger, if if you frame this globally outside of the uh, limited European context, yeah. uh, return to tradition. Return to roots, return to traditional society, return to tradition. Pre-modern. Exactly. And you, so total denial of modernity, but with high technology. And that's fascinating. So you said, what's the future of medieval? It's high technology medieval. It's cyberpunk medieval. Yes. 
That's right. That's <laughs> that's the future. Well, thank you, Ted, um, for for agreeing to to go on this podcasting experiment with me this year. It has been an absolute blast. We have learned a lot. Uh, you know, in terms of the technology behind it, but also in how to engage in this kind of long form conversation. I am super keen for next year. We have a, a really cool lineup of ideas that we want to put together and guests that we want to come in. So this is something we're definitely going to expand and continue on. Thank you, Chris, for uh, being uh, uh, such an awesome uh, partner in, uh, in podcasting and for all these wonderful conversations we've had. So this is seven episodes. Uh, and uh, looking back, it's uh, amazing. We even managed to, uh, to make them, considering uh, how busy we've been this year. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, nevertheless... Um, and thank you for those who have been listening to us. I know you're out there. We, we appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening. And uh, my name is Ted. You can catch me on Twitter at Ted Mitu. And my name is Chris, and you can catch me on Twitter at CL underscore more. Thank you again, and see you online.